I'm going to do something I can only do once a year. Take the privilege of my birthday to do a long lesson. This is on the Beatitudes. In the exegesis of every individual Beatitude, we reflect upon Jesus' invitation to conduct a life of humility, poverty, and mercy. In the Sermon on the Mount, pronounced by Jesus, who enlightened the lives of believers and also non-believers. The proclamation of Beatitudes came about when Jesus saw the crowds up the slope surrounding the Lake of Galilee and sat down and addressed the disciples, proclaiming the Beatitudes. It is a message for all of humanity. Jesus began to teach a new law that calls to us to be poor, meek, and merciful. And these new commandments are much more than norms. In fact, Jesus does not impose anything, but reveals the path to happiness, repeating the word blessed eight times. Each beatitude is composed of three parts. The opening word blessed, followed by the situation in which those who are called blessed find themselves, and finally the reason for which they are blessed. It would be good for you to learn these. Dwelling on the word blessed, in its original meaning, it does not indicate someone with a full belly or who is doing, doing well. It refers to a person who finds him or herself in a state of grace and who is going forward on the path indicated by God with patience, poverty, humility, service for others, and consolation. She or he who goes forward on that path is happy and will be blessed. The first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We are taught there is a poverty that we must accept, that of our own being, and a poverty that we must seek instead from the things of this world. Jesus' way to happiness begins with a paradoxical proclamation, a strange object of bliss. So we ask ourselves, what is meant by this word, poor? Matthew's worse use of the expression poor in spirit shows a spiritual understanding of poverty. Those who are poor in spirit are those who are and feel themselves to be poor in the depths of their being. This is contrary to the message of this world that we live ourselves in. This attitude leads to loneliness and happiness because it sets us in competition with others so that we live in obsessive concern for our own ego. We must remember, though, that we don't have to transform ourselves to become poor in spirit because we are already poor. We are all poor in spirit. The power of human beings, even the greatest empires, pass and disappear. On the contrary, it is the one who knows how to love the true good more than himself who truly reigns. This is the power of God. This is how Christ shows himself to be powerful. Jesus knew how to do what the kings of the earth do not, how to give his life for human beings. This is the true power the power of fraternity, charity, the power of love, and the power of humility. The, pover power, the poverty praised by the first beatitude lays at the service of this freedom. Number two, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Sorrow is rooted in the love of God, and we note that there are two types of sorrow. In ancient Greek, the language, there is a type of deep sorrow called pinthos, an interior sorrow that can open us up to an authentic relationship with God and each other. The Bible speaks of two types of sorrow, the first being the death or suffering of someone. Grief is a bitter road, but it can be used to open one's eyes to life, to the sacred, and to the irreplaceable value of each person. While at that moment, 
one realizes how short life is. The other aspect is found in the tears for one's sin, in one's own sin, for one heart, one's heart bleeds for the pain of having offended God. Taking St. Peter as an example of expressing sorrow for sin, that his sorrow was manifested in his tears after his betrayal of, Saint, of Jesus, which came as a gift from the Holy Spirit, the great comforter. Don't ever stop asking for forgiveness. Don't let your sorrow for the, the betrayal of your sin to God ever cause you to become too afraid or too ashamed to ask for forgiveness. So long as you are able to feel that sorrow for the loss of his love, your heart is still alive and open to God's grace and intervention. And your heart is open especially for his forgiveness. Number three. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness unites us, anger divides us. We reflect on Jesus' invitation to meekness and urge Christians to be a people of mercy and hope. A meek person in the 21st century is a person who is kind and shuns violence, refu refusing to grow angry when passions run high. The third beatitude ultimately points us to our heavenly homeland. A meek disciple of Christ is a person that is moderate in their passions and moods. She or he has learned to defend their peace, their relationship with God, and the gifts of God, mercy, fraternity, trust, and hope. Meekness unites, anger divides. Anger is the opposite of meekness and destroys many important things when left uncontrolled. Anger caused many siblings to cease speaking to one another. A meek person is able to win over hearts and save friendships because angry people calm down. This is how we can rebuild relationships with meekness. Number four. Blessed are those who are hungry and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Jesus speaks not only of hungering and thirsting for personal and social justice, but also points to the deeper yearning for righteousness in the eyes of God. Psalm 63 expresses this. O God, you are my God. I pine for you. My heart thirsts for you. St. Augustine says simply, You have put, made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. This desire for righteousness lies within every human heart and finds its fulfillment in Christ, who through the Paschal mystery has reconciled us to the Father and calls us to share with every one the good news of our justification. The fourth beatitude promises us that by promoting justice in this highest sense, we will find true satisfaction, for our thirsting for righteousness will be quenched by the love God pours out upon his children. Number five. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. This beatitude is different than all the others, for it is the only one in which the cause and the effect of happiness coincide. Those who exercise mercy shall be shown mercy. The theme of reciprocity we see here is not only a characteristic of this beatitude, but is repeated throughout the entire gospel. How could it be otherwise? For mercy is the very heart of God. This theme is also very clear in the Lord's Prayer, where we say, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Alone, we cannot mirror God's mercy. We need the grace of God, and we must ask for it. There is no Christianity without mercy. Number six. Blessed are those pure of heart, for they shall see God. The sixth beatitude promises that those with a pure heart shall see God. To be able to contemplate this beatitude 
it is necessary to look deep within our hearts and make space for God. To see God, it is not necessary to change our glasses or from the place from which we are looking. Our heart needs to be liberated from its deceit. When we realize that we are our own worst enemy, then we have reached a decisive maturation process. The heart is the most intimate part of the human being, the interior space where a person is him or herself. In this beatific vision, there is a future dimension, the joy of the kingdom of heaven. But there is also another. To see God means discerning the designs of providence in what happens, recognizing his presence in the sacrament, in our brothers and sisters, and above all, in the poor and suffering, to recognize God where he manifests himself. Number seven. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. One kind of peace can be seen in the biblical term shalom, which signifies an abundant, fl flourishing life. A second kind is in the modern notion of interior serenity. Yet this second time of peace is incomplete, since spiritual growth often occurs precisely when our tranquility has somehow been disturbed. We see Christ bringing the gift of his own peace. The Lord bestows his gift not as the world does, but by destroying hostility in his own person. A peacemaker, then, is someone who is God's grace, imitates Jesus in bringing reconciliation to others by giving of themselves, always and everywhere. Those who do so are true children of God and show us the way of true happiness. Number eight. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All the attitudes contained in the Beatitudes, when lived for Christ, can lead to oppression by the world. Yet ultimately this persecution is a cause for joy in heaven. The way of the Beatitudes is a Pentecostal path, leading us from selfishness to a life guided by the Spirit. We see this in the saints who show that the experience of persecution can set the Christian free from worldly compromise. May we too always remain salt of the earth and no chance losing our taste of the gospel and that we lead others to disdain it. By God's grace, whatever trials we do face can draw us to become more like Christ who leads us to a new life. In this manner, following the humble way of the Beatitudes, we will come to experience the kingdom of heaven, our greatest joy and happiness. In the joy of the risen Christ, I invoke upon you and your families the loving mercy of God, our Father. May the Lord bless you all.